you know, you'd have one or two that popped up and then nothing. We really started to see the population become established um, kind of in the early 80s, and it was the eastern part of the state. Um, those were also from illegal translocations of coyotes from outside the state that are brought into eastern North Carolina. We do have something in North Carolina called fox preserves, basically fenced-in enclosures where people uh, put foxes in. They started to stalk them with coyotes. And as we see in eastern North Carolina, you know, hurricanes come through. Guess what? Tree falls on the fence, boom, coyote can come out. As well as coyotes are just good at climbing fences, so they'll just get out on their own. So we started to get more reports of coyotes in eastern North Carolina, and it was always within proximity of a fox preserve. But then we started to see natural migration into the western county, such as Polk County and others, in about the late 1980s. These coyotes were coming on their own from Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, you know, even Virginia, other places where they'd become established and now they expanded into Western North Carolina. To be honest, how coyotes are moving into these Western counties in the late 80s, I'm seeing the same thing almost with armadillos. Armadillos are in my program. Uh, I'm now an armadillo biologist. Uh, maybe that's another talk, because those are pretty fascinating critters. They're kind of following, I'm seeing the same pattern in how armadillos are coming into the state from surrounding states. And then in 1988, we saw those eastern coyotes that western population, they started to merge towards the center. And just so you can visually see what I'm talking about, I have these maps. So here's 1988 again. This is where we see populations becoming established. Again, that's from coyotes escaping from fox preserves. But we have these. These are also escapees. However, there in 1990, here's we see natural migration, as well as natural migration coming up from South Carolina. 1996, already, just in that short time, we see coyotes have established in over half the state. 2000, 2003, only Dare County stands alone, um, mainly because of the barrier that uh, the uh, Alligator River, which goes through here, served. And then 2005, we confirmed them in Dare County. 2009 is when we confirmed them on the Outer Banks. So as of 2005, they were statewide, but they made it to the Outer Banks and they're established there in 2009. Um, as I said, natural migration combined with some help from hunters, you really, really, really some them, but again, not from the biologists. And they're here to stay. They're well established, they're here to stay. Uh, coyotes description, you know, I didn't put this up as a myth, but a lot of people think coyotes are bigger than they actually are. Um, you know, when we get reports, we hear these super coyotes, they're huge. But I tell people that coyotes, their fur is incredible, especially in their time. You're just looking at a fuzzed up coyote. You know, the fur makes it look larger. They're typically same as a mid-sized dog, 25 to 40 pounds. We on occasion will get a 50 plus pound coyote, but it's pretty uncommon. So 25 to 40, and they come in a variety of color morphs. Typically they're gray, but they can be black, blonde, once in a while white and then black. Um, and that's what I have the colors up here for. You know, we're, we're still learning about what's the genetics behind these color morphs, but there was one study in Pennsylvania where a researcher looked at their coyotes and found the more blonde and, and red and black coyotes, you found a higher percentage of dog genetics. The ones that were traditionally gray, you actually found a slightly higher percentage of gray wolf genetics. Remember, those coyotes came through Canada and then to northeastern states and came south, those coyotes would have encountered gray wolves. And at that time, gray wolf populations were really low, which increased the chance that maybe a wolf would interbreed with a coyote. Life history, um, they do live in family units, mainly the breeding pair and the young. What you tend to see is most of the young, they'll leave their parents, but sometimes, typically the females might stay and stay with their parents for another year or two to help take care of the next round of pups. They breed in February and March, and then they have their pups born in April and May, and they range from four to eight pups, but it can really vary, but that's the average. We've seen litters as high as 14 to 16 pups. We've seen litters below four, but typically it's four to eight. And then home range is about three to 11 square miles. Really depends on if it's a male or female, or maybe what we call a transient coyote, which is a coyote that's left the breeding pair, left mom and dad, and they're trying to find a territory of their own, and they just kind of live a transient lifestyle, kind of like uh, teenagers that leave the house. 
takes them a while to settle down. Um, that's what we see with our coyotes. Um, so that really dictates the home range as well as, of course, breeding season. We might see an expansion of home range um, during the breeding season. But 3 to 11 square miles. And I say that because we'll get phone calls from someone you know, town, they're like, we've got tons of coyotes. And then, you know, we're getting them over here, and then we get sightings on across town. We tell those folks it's probably the same coyote. It's nothing for a coyote to cross town like that. And that's what we usually tend to see is, you know, so people get the image that there's a lot of coyotes when actually it's just one or two coyotes. They're just really good at navigating the town. And yeah, they're going to show up on opposite sides of the town because of their large home range. Um, again, 20 to 40 percent of the population is usually made up of these transient coyotes, just coyotes going around looking for an empty territory. Coyotes are the most adaptable mammal. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a more adaptable mammal beyond the coyote. As you saw from that range map, how quickly they were able to spread to eastern United States, expand into all of North America and Central America and then North Carolina. And we see their adaptability with the habitat, you know, so they can be kind of open, they're an open plain species traditionally. But yeah, of course, mountains, no problem. You know, we see them on the Outer Banks. Um, urban areas, golf courses, cemeteries, popular areas to see coyotes. Uh, <laughs> we've had coyotes end up inside of structures. This was in Chicago on the subway. <laughs> yeah. Again, a neighborhood. Um, food habits, again, very adaptable. You know, they all eat whatever is usually most abundant in an area, which makes sense. They don't want to spend a lot of their energy trying to find scarce resources. So whatever food's most abundant, that's what you're going to find in a coyote's diet. So berries, I know right now I've been noticing up here the blueberries and the uh, blackberries are like just about ripe, probably about a week away. And you're definitely going to see coyotes taking advantage of that as well as black bears. But they'll eat small prey mice, rodents, rabbits, um, insects. Sometimes we'll find scat loaded with grasshoppers. Um, they'll, again, whatever's most abundant. Um, they'll go into a farm, they'll actually eat crops. So they will de depredate on, on people's crops, including, I have a picture coming up, poultry. They will go after uh, unsecured livestock and poultry, but especially chickens if they're available. Cats can be vulnerable, um, again, a coyote just views a cat as just any other small prey item. They don't know it's someone's pet. And that's what we have to educate people when they get upset because they think their cat's been eaten by a coyote is, you know, the coyote wasn't doing anything personally to you, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I own three cats. Um, they are indoor cats. I don't let them go outside. But yeah, I'd be really upset if anything happened to my cats. I understand. But again, the coyote, don't take it personally. They just viewed it as another prey item. They didn't view it as your, aunt, your pet. Watermelons, they, I go back to crops, they will take advantage of watermelons. In fact, some of our producers down east will report, they'll go out to the watermelon patch and there'll be bite marks. Just like people, they're testing the ripeness of the watermelon. They are, yeah. I will tell you, I, I see those coyotes, I see those bears. They can be quite picky. If there's an abundant food resource, they'll start to get picky about what they eat. <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and that's to the chagrin of the farmer because suddenly, yeah, the coyote might have only taken two watermelons, but in the process, damaged 20 or 30. Um, so that, that, that farmer's not too happy. And then we do see squirrels, you know, again, that small prey. Um, and they do, on occasion, will eat a fawn. Um, they do eat deer, though, as you'll see in a slide, it will vary. And Canada geese, um, which in a way can be beneficial where we have an overabundance of Canada geese, yeah. <laughs> and then behavior, yeah. They, they do not care about us, you know. Um, they will live in the rural environment, but they'll also live in a highly urban environment with a lot of people. They can adapt to living near a lot of human disturbances. All right, so myth number two, they're killing all the deer. They're killing all the turkeys. I get this all the time. Um, they're having an impact, Tur you know, deer in decline because of the coyote. So this might be hard to read for everybody, but it's just an example of three diet studies that occurred here in the southeast, one in Virginia, western Virginia, so similar 
habitat, topography, ecosystem as Western North Carolina. One that occurred in Eastern North Carolina, Amar Peninsula, and then one in Fort Bragg. And it, what I did was I circled what was the top prey, you know, top food item in these coyotes scat. What did they find? Um, in Western Virginia, it was white-tailed deer, 42%. Now, key though is we don't know how much of that is predation versus scavenging, you know. And there's actually Virginia Tech; they're actively trying to determine can we can we determine if this, you know, if we find deer in scat, is there any way to figure out if it's scavenging or predation? Um, and it's going to be challenging. They think they can do it, but we'll see. Here in the Amara Peninsula. It was small animals, rabbits and small rodents, comprised over 50% of a coyote's diet, which again could be very beneficial um, in that ecosystem because those are abundant prey items. And then on Fort Bragg, 40% of the diet was vegetation. So it's kind of reflecting, you know, when, you see, when people talk about like, what, what are coyotes eating? My answer is it really depends on where they are. What is most abundant? that's what you're going to probably find in that coyote's diet. Again, they're going after the easy food source, but it also shows the diversity of their diet. The thing is, coyotes can be beneficial. Um, you know, the impacts they have, especially on prey animals, can be minimal to beneficial. Um, these are all animals, you know, especially raccoons and squirrels or nest predators can really have an impact on bird species, especially sensitive bird species. Cats, oh yeah, cats, We'll go after small mammals. We'll go after uh, small birds. I was just talking to one of the gentlemen about how I'm doing a weasel survey and doing more research on weasels in North Carolina. Um, the only way I can get my hands on a weasel is from ones that a cat has brought to their owner. And then the owner calls me up and says, hey, I have a dead weasel. Are you interested? I'm like, very. <laughs> Please put it in your freezer and we'll pick it up. Um, <laughs> And, and they're willing to. I'm very impressed with the number of people willing to do that. So it's, I'm glad I'm getting the weasel carcasses. They'll serve a positive use. But that's what I'm finding. When I talk to our wildlife rehabbers about, hey, do you ever get weasels? They'll say yes. And I'm like, so what, why did you get it? Cats. You got injured by a cat. Um, and then again, red foxes can also be nest predators. And so coyotes do have impacts on these species. Can cause them to go into decline. Um, but guess what? That has a benefit um, to waterfowl, to songbirds, to shorebirds. So we can see that those impacts can be beneficial. However, yeah, it's, you know, if a prey population is low, usually due to other factors, and the number one factor is usually habitat. You know, if you have a prey population such as turkeys or such as deer, and that population seems to be under stress, I can guarantee it's a habitat factor. You know, something that it's, they don't have ideal habitat. So that population's, you know, low for other factors. That's when we see the additional pressure of coyote predation is what we in the wildlife field called additive. You know, we have compensatory and additive mortality. Compensatory is where, yeah, a coyote kills a deer, but that deer would have died anyway of something else, hit by a car, disease, maybe hunter harvest. However, additive means, well, now we're adding additional mortality. Mortality is not doing this, that coyote predation is causing it to go higher. But again, we mainly see that when the prey population is low due to other factors. Um, and so it's better to usually address those other factors for the long-term health of that prey population. Um, but we also see, and I like this photo, is, you know, this is an example of shorebirds, you know, they use the nest enclosures. However, animals gotta eat, coyotes gotta eat, predators gotta eat. They're very good at figuring things out. And so this shows how it was breached. Basically, the coyote dug. This is actually a sea turtle. I'm for, I, meant, I said shorebird, sea turtle, where the animal actually dug until it got under the enclosure. Um, barely, not surprisingly, highly food-motivated animals. So this is also part of that myth of they're killing all the deer. So this was on, um, there is a coyote a killing contest here in North Carolina. I think it's called the Carolina Classic. Anyway, they had this on their Facebook page and it said, you know, it claimed, and it's not true, I don't know where they got this information, that one female coyote, in order to provide food for her pups, will kill 19 fawns. And so then someone posted, well, I hunted five coyotes, they were all females, 
So five times 19, so that's almost 100 fonts. They're like, I saved 100 fonts. <laughs> and the big thing is what, even if this is true, which is not, even if this were true, the assumption is these fonts would survive if not for the coyote. Completely wrong. You know, fonts are very susceptible to all kinds of forms of mortality. Again, disease, starvation, uh, getting hit by a car, getting killed by a dog. That happens a lot more than people like to admit. Um, so no, again, going back to that additive compensatory, you can't assume just because you took care of the coyote that that prey species is going to survive. Um, myth number three: This area is overloaded with coyotes. There's too many coyotes. I, I know there's about at least 20 coyotes next to my house. Um, this is all usually based off people hearing the coyote howl. They'll hear coyotes howl and they'll start to make these kinds of statements when they call us up. Oh, I heard the coyote howl, it was blood curdling. They must have just killed something. Um, it's malicious sounding, you know, it's, it's aggressive, it's dangerous. So howls really freak people out. Um, and of course, you cannot determine the number of coyotes based off howling. I, I've talked to people that are convinced you can, you cannot, they, their howl is very hollow and you know, no one's really been able to prove this, but I'm positive one reason that howl is hollow in the way it sounds is that again, hunt, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years of evolution, coyotes used to be prey. They, you know, they were killed by those larger predators. However, if they howled and it made it sound like there's more of them than they actually are, maybe that predator would think twice about going after them. So I, I think that's part of the reason is that how fools uh, even other animals into thinking there's more than they really are. Yet yeah, one or two coyotes can sound like 20, um, but you cannot count um, how many coyotes there are. And you can't determine distance. That's the other one is, the coyotes are right next to my house howling. You gotta do something. You can't. I mean, I, where I live, I have coyotes howl. And yeah, they sound really close, but I also know they're probably, they could easily be a mile away. Um, it's just that sound really can carry. The other thing is, yeah, people think that when a coyote howls, it, it's malicious. Yeah, they just killed something and they're celebrating. I've heard that. <laughs> they're celebrating their kill. You know, how dare they? Um, I mean, one, they should. I mean, they got to eat again, but that, that's not why they're doing it. One, the main reason is to locate other pack members. You know, hey, I'm over here. Oh, you're over there. Okay, now I know where you're at. It can also distract threats away from their den. And a great example of this is when I was working out west, um, I was camping with my colleague. It's about six o'clock at night, and we kept hearing the t coyote, either one or two, and we'd hear it over here howl, and then we'd hear it over here howling. And it, for like an hour, we're like, what the heck is going on in my colleague? So I'm gonna go out there and look. And we happened to be in a very open field. We were in a little RV trailer, and an open field. And so she decided to check it out and I go with her. And we're walking and suddenly we see a mountain lion. Um, very impressive. I'll tell you this, my first thought when I saw the mountain lion is, what is an African lion doing in Montana? <laughs> I did. I, and then I'm like, oh crap, that, of course that's a mountain lion, but the way it moved, you know, it looked just like you see on National Geographic or Discovery Channel. And it, you know, I won't go into that cool sighting, but we figured out the mountain lion was near that coyote's den and those coyotes were trying to distract it. Hey, come over here, this is where I'm in. Oh no, no, I'm, I'm over here. They're trying to pull that mountain lion away from their den and my guess is they were successful. They'll mark their territory. Coyotes can be very territorial, so that's a good way to mark their territory. And then starting about August, September, that's when you start to hear the pups. They start practicing. Um, and that's when you get the more yip, yip, yip. Like it's just, it's not a very nice howl. Um, that's the pups starting to practice. Um, at sometimes a rendezvous site. So sometimes they'll move from a den site to what we call a rendezvous site. We see this with wolves as well. And that's kind of where now you're away from the den, but it's a concentrated area for the pups to play. Um, and then they'll also practice their howls. And by the way, coyote, the claim is, it comes from the Aztec word uh, coyote. Uh, it's uh, barking dog, is the Aztec word for barking dog. And again, that's why with coyotes, you don't tend to hear that nice full-throated howl like you would with the wolf. 
It is more of a bark, a yip. It's not as pleasant, but again, serves a lot of purposes. All right, myth number three. My cat's missing. Coyotes must have taken it. And yes, this is a coyote that has a cat in its mouth. Um, eh, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many of you guys have seen this video. It's pretty impressive. Um, so it could happen, uh, but maybe not. When a cat goes missing, it could be for any number of reasons. It could be a dog got it. Could be, yeah. yeah. Now I will say this ends happily for the cat. I would not show you a video. <laughs> no, keep watching. Keep. Don't run away. There. <laughs> So I'm going to admit, I'm a cat lover. Again, I own three cats. I love those three cats dearly. I don't know if I'm happy with how this ended because I'm also a biologist and I know the impact that outdoor cats have on native wildlife. So I'm mixed. I'm impressed with the cat, but I'm also like, well, now that cat lives another day to kill birds. So I don't know how I feel about it if I'm being honest. But yeah, perhaps, but again, there's a number of other dangers that cats face, dogs, cars, other people getting picked, out, picked up because someone thinks it's a stray and takes it in or brings it to a shelter. We don't know. There's no correlation between coyotes showing up and people saying, oh, all the cats are gone. Um, we really, when it comes down to it, we don't see that relationship. But yeah, coyotes will go after cats and small dogs. They view them as prey. And they will go after large dogs because they view them as competitors. They view them as a threat to their territory and their den. Mainly we see coyotes go after large dogs usually when the pups are born. So starting in April and May, that's when coyotes get really defensive of their pups. And we might start to see interactions between large dogs and coyotes. Yeah, coyotes are dangerous. Kill all of them. Uh, I get this. Um, it, it's funny. I will get hunters telling me that you know they were walking out and they heard a coyote howl, and they're like, "Oh, I'm lucky I made it out alive." <laughs> Which I'm like, "Dude, come on! <laughs> Please." I'll say this: when I'm in the woods, the only thing I ever worry about when I'm in the woods is other dogs and people. Yes. Those are my time. <laughs> You can't, I can usually predict how a wild animal is going to behave. I can't predict how dogs are going to behave, especially feral dogs. I definitely can't predict how people are going to behave. So that's what I'm worried about. But yeah, coyotes are dangerous. Thankfully, attacks are very, very rare, especially here in North Carolina. And I just put this up again. You've seen that picture. This is a great, this is one also from Chicago. Um, a coyote, it was a hot summer really hot summer day. The coyote went into a Quiznos in downtown Chicago, jumped in the cooler, and went to sleep. It went to sleep. The customers were in there. So, you know, I don't want to, you know, it's still a wild animal. We have to respect wild animals, but their tolerance for people is pretty high. They're just not that interested in us. Um, they ended up capturing this coyote, moving it, and releasing it elsewhere. But it was pretty impressive. Uh, the, the picture outside of the Quiznos, I mean, they had the full armada of the police and fire department. <laughs> and this coyote's just like, I just want to stay cool for now. Yeah. Now, usually when we do tend to see, you know, an, a situation where maybe a coyote's made contact with a person, is its disease, mainly rabies. Yeah, with rabies, completely different story. And I see this as well with bobcats. Whenever I hear of a report of a bobcat attacking someone, I'll say, I bet that bobcat's rabid. Boom, it always is. Again, when, when an animal, wild animal has rabies, it affects the brain, that animal's not gonna act normal. Um, and so this is actually a picture, this was in Charlotte, where these people pulled into their garage, to their driveway, and face this coyote. And it was doing, I mean, it was as, you know, it was doing that the whole time. Um, they ended up uh, pulling out and they called the police department who dispatched the animal. That coyote had rabies. So, you know, not to be totally dismissive, because again, wild animals, as well as when it has rabies, they can act very differently than they normally would. Again, though, coyotes, it's pretty rare they, they get rabies. Um, as you can see, this is, we see since 1990, we've had almost 8,000 raccoons test positive. 
Um, in comparison, we've had 22 coyotes during that same time frame. So we average about, yeah, maybe one coyote a year is positive. And usually it's not a situation like this. It's other situations, thankfully, in which, you know, there wasn't an aggress aggressive situation. But it can happen. A few years ago outside of Statesville, we also had someone that um, got it, you know, got bit by a coyote. And we never got our hands on it. But the description, I said that coyote likely had rabies is passed away. Because once they start showing this, they're only a few days away from succumbing to the rabies. Um, but thankfully, it is very rare among coyotes. The only other time I, you know, we usually see an interaction between coyotes and people is if it's called habituate, if it's habituated. Basically, it's gotten conditioned to people. It's actually maybe gotten rewarded for being near people. That's when we can see issues. Um, they're not only used to being around people because there's no threat. They're like, hey, I can be around people and people aren't bothering me. But there's also unnatural food sources, garbage, pet food, bird feeders that attract a bunch of their prey species. And so that coyote goes to the bird feeder, but is also in someone's backyard, so they start to get used to being around people or being directly rewarded with people directly feeding coyotes. We do see that. People will feed coyotes. That's not a good situation. Um, in I worked in Massachusetts for a couple years as there for a barobiologist. And in that situation, we, we had a few coyote attacks different coyotes. Uh, one coyote was, yeah, people had been feeding it. it the that coyote eventually went up to a, a little girl that was on a swing and bit her on the butt. Um, I know. Thankfully, you know, pretty minor wounds and that coyote was captured. We had another coyote that uh, went after someone and bit them. We got our hands on that coyote and we were like, wait, you know, we did x-rays and we're like, it looks like it has a a healed leg, you know, perfectly set. That doesn't happen in nature. We trace it out of rehab where Lily rehabbed that coyote. And so in the process of being rehabbed, it got heavily habituated and relying on people. So that's the thing is they're rewarding the behavior. And again, it is a wild animal. So you're suddenly making it used to people, but it still has its wild instincts. And sometimes that's where we see conflicts. But again, very rare, especially here in North Carolina. It's definitely not a top concern that I have, um, but just something to be cognizant of. Myth number six. Yeah, coyotes can be eradicated. Get rid of all the coyotes. Uh, bounties work. Um, you know, I see this a lot on our comment page, you know, on Facebook. I wish they'd do something about all these coyotes. Um, I don't know who the they is. I think it's implied me, but uh, they never specify, they just said they. They need to get rid of them. Again, is that me? I don't know. Someone has to. Um, yeah, lots of challenges of, of coyote control, mainly because, again, coyotes are very adaptable. Um, you know, we see that as they start to expand across the United States, the government back in the, you know, from the early 1900s, probably until about the 1950s, did everything they could to eradicate coyotes. You know, using methods we would never do now, such as poisoning, um, you know, and other things, you know, uh, I, I don't even want to mention some of the other things that were being done to try to get rid of coyotes, but they're methods that we would not do now. And again, all that happened was coyotes continue, continue to expand. And it's for these three main reasons. One, they can have high reproductive capacity, as I mentioned. We've documented 16 pups. Um, they are good at dispersing, um, and I'll show this slide later. Um, as well as they are kind of density dependent feedback mechanism. And I'll explain more of what I mean in a future slide. So let's look at dispersal. So here's a coyote, it was caught, here's Dare County, oh, there's Dare County, so this is um, Terrell County. Uh, it was part of a research project, the coyote was caught and they had a tracking collar put on it. And that coyote ended up north of Durham. It ended up getting hit by a car, which is how we were able to um, find out where it ended up. But again, they have high potential dispersal. So when, I tell, when someone sees a coyote in their backyard, they're like, you need to come get your coyote. <laughs> That's another one I get a lot. One thing I'll tell them is that coyote may never show up again. It could be another county over, um, for all we know. Yeah, this was a sub-adult female. So this is Fort Bragg. This is that Fort Bragg research project. That coyote ended up getting into South Carolina and almost into, uh, let's see if I remember my geography, that should be, I think that's Alabama, or no, that's Georgia, yeah, thank you, that's Georgia. So, and it was interesting, the other thing I talk about is, um, 
it's hard for a large predator to hide nowadays. Um, and so this, all these coyotes were caught on cameras all along the way because there's just, there's at least a million game cameras out on the landscape. And so we were getting pictures of this coyote the entire way. People, hey, there's a coyote with a collar and they'd find out it was part of Fort Bragg. This is also Fort Bragg. Look how far that coyote traveled. That was another female. It's not just males, it's females that have high dispersal. So again, you remove coyotes from one area, guess what? It's gonna get quickly filled in. You have a vacant territory, another coyote's gonna be coming in right away because of their high potential for dispersal. Adaptability and mortality. So here is, you know, coyotes have an average litter size, average survival rate, uh, average number of yearlings that breed, but then if you put in high mortality, so you kill a lot of them, well, suddenly you have a decreased competition for food resources and for other resources, such as, you know, where to den, hiding cover. So decreased competition, what we see is coyotes respond. Mm -hmm. They all respond with the increase in their litter size, increased pup survivorship, because there's more food, so those pups have a greater chance of surviving. Uh, and we start to see the number of young coyotes that breed increase. And then we see if there's low mortality, again, increased competition for food, then we see that reduction in litter sizes. So it's just cyclical. Um, we tell people, you know, you can determine how many coyotes, and there's actually research from a, from a there's a, a professor out of uh, University of Georgia that did research to answer the question, okay, if I remove X number of coyotes on the landscape on my property, he looked into how many coyotes will be there in 10 years, same number. Pretty much you remove 10 coyotes from your property, 10 years later, you know, within, you're gonna have 10 coyotes in 10 years. You're gonna have 10 coyotes probably the next year. Um, so yeah, because they can respond. So yeah, we cannot eradicate. People tell us all the time, why can't you eradicate coyotes? It's not possible. We'd have, there's some research that did modeling that said you'd have to remove at least 70% of the population to force a decline, but you'd have to do that every year, every single year. It is not realistic, and to be honest, it's not desired. We don't need to eradicate coyotes, um, but even if you wanted to, you wouldn't be able to. Um, so that kind of gets into how do coyotes interact with people, because this is why we get those phone calls. This is why people say, do something about coyotes, get rid of them, is we do see interactions, and some of those interactions are negative. Now, coyotes will prey on livestock. It's not as common as people think, but it can happen. However, prior to 2000, when coyotes were still expanding across the state, you know, livestock producers blamed dogs. And they were right. You know, dogs kill a lot of livestock. Dogs kill a lot of poultry. However, once coyotes became established across the state, suddenly the blame shifted to coyotes. Um, we started hearing from livestock producers, oh, coyotes killed it. And one reason is they were hearing the coyotes more. And so they heard the howling, they're like, oh, now my calf is dead, it must be the coyote. The reality is both can be responsible, but again, it's probably more likely dogs than coyotes. And what I tell farmers is just because you hear coyotes howling doesn't mean that they're gonna kill your livestock, or they have. Um, if you talk to, you know, talking to some of these trappers that will assist with livestock producers, you know, these trappers say, oh yeah, the guy totally thought it was a coyote that killed his calves. You know, I, was, I didn't think it was, but I decided to set traps, and they're like, all I caught were dogs, neighbor's dogs, or sometimes even the farmer's own dog is responsible. You know, dogs, you know, they can be pretty vicious. Um, you know, and so we do see dogs are still responsible for quite a bit of livestock depredation, though coyotes will once in a while. Um, the big thing that makes them vulnerable, of course, if that livestock is unprotected. Um, you know, there's nothing to be, nothing done for good husbandry practices. More in the urban environment, the type of interactions we see is mainly observations. Um, people see in coyotes, but to that person, that's a problem. You know, they think, oh, I see a coyote in my neighborhood, that's a problem. No, coyote's just doing its normal thing. And the reason it's there is because of all the food in the urban environment. You, know, you got your bird feeders that are attracting a number of prey species. I call it a prey hotspot for a coyote. I mean, yeah, sometimes you'll see coyotes maybe eating the bird seed itself, 
but more it's the prey species that are attracted that that's going to attract not only coyotes but other species such as foxes. Pet food, that's a big one. People that feed pets outside are these feral cat colonies that will attract coyotes um, as well as just other things such as garbage. And then as I already mentioned, because they're being rewarded for being close to people, um, they start to associate people with having food. But again, despite that, we don't see too many true conflicts. So what do we do? Because yeah, there are interactions and sometimes there is truly an issue. Uh, what we do is, like I said, we can't eradicate the coyote. We can't control coyote numbers. As one researcher, Dr. Dana Morin, who's now at Mississippi State, said, the only thing that can manage coyotes is coyotes themselves. Coyotes are great at managing themselves. Um, and I, I agree with her. So what our agency takes approach is we try to manage individual situations. You know, if we truly do have a problem, it's usually just with an individual coyote and so it's focusing on that individual problem coyote, that coyote that maybe we did confirm killed livestock, or maybe we do have a coyote that's showing more bold and aggressive behavior. It's focusing on the individual, um, as well as trying to encourage prevention measures. Let, let's keep conflicts from happening. Um, you know, let's be proactive. We manage conflicts basically case by case. So some of the tools we, we encourage the public to consider um, include non-lethal education, that's our number one. Almost all the phone calls we get about coyotes, it's the same with bears and other species. The number one resolution is education. Educating the person on why the animal's there. Hey, it's not a big deal to see a bear in your neighborhood. It's not a big deal to see a coyote in your neighborhood. That's normal behavior. Um, and, and telling them the basics of coyote biology. We can encourage tolerance. So this is uh, the number of phone calls my agency gets about coyotes in North Carolina. I know it's hard to read, but the blue bar is the one to key on. This is back in 2015 when we first started our hotline. This is 2021. And these are all the phone calls we got in which the person reported nuisance or damage from a coyote. Um, and you can see in 2021, it was about 530 phone calls. I want to say, most of these, even so, it's nuisance slash damage. You know, that's what the person thought it was. They reported the coyote as a nuisance. Overall, it was just a coyote doing what coyotes do. You know, just being present. Um, but again, sometimes just being present, you know, someone thinks that's a nuisance situation. So we encourage tolerance. This is why the coyote's there. You know, if just tolerate it. That's the best thing you can do because if you remove that coyote, another one's going to take its place. The other thing is modifying human behavior. This is the big one we touch on. Removal of attractants. Again, why is the coyote there? Let's key into it and let's remove it. Again, unsecured pet food and garbage. We encourage people to contain their animals. Leash your dog. Well, you know, when we see interactions between coyotes and large dogs, it's because the large dog's unleashed and then sniffs something, maybe chases, you know, goes after because there's a coyote den nearby or a coyote and suddenly there's a confrontation. So control your animal, especially if you leash your dog, it's near you, that, that coyote's less likely to approach the dog with a the human there. Um, again, coyotes really, thankfully, something about us being on two legs and probably you know, decades of human persecution, they usually don't want to have anything to do with us. So we do see improvements where if the dog is near the person, you're less likely to have a confrontation between a coyote and a large dog. Keeping cats indoors if possible, though I talked to one gentleman in the audience who he still lets his cats outside, but he brings them in at night. You know, he noticed coyotes were in the area, brought them in at night, and that's keeping his cats safe from those coyotes. Um, but we also encourage keeping cats indoors. <coughs> Fencing can work if it's feasible, if it's possible. So fencing your backyard, say you want to let your dog out but not supervise it. Well, fencing can create that barrier between the coyote and the dog. Uh, this is fencing now that you're, we're seeing more and more in the southwest. I'm not really seeing in the southeast yet, but in the southwest, you see more of this fencing. People view that it's just it's nicer than <coughs> traditional chain link fencing. Um, and they feel it's fairly effective at keeping coyotes out, mainly because the top, you know, it's, it's not even. So one, it's harder for a coyote to get a perch but also because of that jagged thing, it kind of makes it harder for the coyote to figure out how to get over versus you know, an even thing where they can get their paws more perched up and then pull themselves over. Uh, we also see these rollers uh, where people install these rollers 
And, uh, you know, in theory, the coyote comes up, hits the rollers, and then poof, slips back down. Pretty good. I wouldn't say they're 100% effective, but they'll probably keep out most coyotes. I'm seeing now these more advertised as well, not only for coyotes, but to keep your dogs in, to keep your cats in, or maybe to keep dogs outside dogs from getting into your fenced-in area. So these are, have several applications. And then for our livestock producers, increased husbandry practices, um, mainly through the use of guard animals. Guard animals are pretty effective. This is a gentleman from Brunswick County, a farmer who felt he was having issues with coyotes and, and livestock depredation. He got this donkey, and he said he had zero issues after that. Donkeys are aggressive. Um, they can be very aggressive. This is actually not the same donkey. This is another donkey, and that is a coyote in its mouth. So they can be very good at protecting the livestock. Of course, your traditional livestock protection dog um, can be very effective. And this is just, it's hard to see. Mainly just see this is, you know, before uh, livestock protection animals were used. In this case, llamas. Llamas are another great livestock protection animal where about 11, you know, they had an annual loss of their sheep that they attributed to coyotes. Once they got llamas, it went down to 1%. So we really encourage that. It's still a relatively new idea here in North Carolina. That's pretty common out west now, but it's still a relatively new idea. I'll say another thing is when I worked out west of Montana, um, I would work, talk to ranchers, and we were trapping for gray wolves. This is back in 97, 98, when gray wolves were coming down from Canada into Montana, and mostly they were on private property. So we had to get permission from ranchers to trap, to capture the wolves, to get tracking collars on them. And I would run into some ranchers that, you know, I talked to them and say, hey, you probably won't be happy, but if we catch coyotes, we're letting them go. You know, we, we're not gonna remove them. Um, that's not why we're here. And I would run to ranchers that would say, good. They're like, because my coyotes are behaving. I don't have any issues with my coyotes. They're not going after my livestock. So I want to keep them here. Um, and that's what I tell farmers here is just because you hear a coyote howling doesn't mean dead livestock. There's, you know, in fact, you know, if you hear them howling but you're not having any depredation issues, you want to keep those coyotes. Those are the good behaving coyotes. They haven't keyed in or learned to identify livestock as prey, you want to keep those coyotes around. Um, and that's what they do out west on some ranching property is, yeah, they're, they're not all anti-predator. They view that, hey, these are good coyotes. I want to keep them as my good neighbors because who knows if those bad neighbors will move in if these guys leave. Myth, so that being said, all the non-lethal, this is the last myth I'll talk about today. Hunting and trapping are useless for managing coyotes. You know, I talked about you can't control coyotes. Uh, they're here to stay. You remove one, another one's going to move in. Um, but that is not to say hunting and trapping are useless. Um, and I, when I talk about hunting and trapping, I'm talking about regulated hunting and trapping. So we can see some benefits. They can be tools to resolve individual problem issues. So if you are having a problem with a coyote, say it again, it's being bold and aggressive. Say it has keyed in to your livestock. Um, you should target that individual one. But again, targeting the individual problem coyote, not all the coyotes. We do see where hunting and trapping occurs. Coyotes are more wary of people, which is a good thing. We like our, all of our wildlife to be wary of people. I love when bears are wary of people. That keeps bears out of trouble, keeps bears safe when they're wary of people. We also see coyotes, there's been research, mainly out west, that saw where you had hunting and trapping, coyotes changed their behavior. They remained more nocturnal. They also were more likely to avoid people in populated areas. Um, as well as, to be honest, this is probably one of the big things. If we have regulated hunting and trapping, as a tool for addressing individual conflicts, it really reduces illegal and unethical behavior. A uh, good example of this, Wake County, where Raleigh is, um, we found out that an animal control officer, when people would call to report conflicts with coyotes, he would tell them, uh, there's really nothing you can do. You can't shoot within Wake County. Um, I don't know if you can trap, but..." Just go to the store, buy a pound of ground beef, buy some rat poisoning, 
yes. And I see this with a lot of others, uh, like where if you don't have a tool for people, a regulated tool for people to use when they really do have a conflict, they all find a way to remove that animal. Um, they don't want it there. So we try to encourage a legal, regulated, more ethical way than, yes, poisoning or other things that I've seen people do because they don't think they have a choice. Again, they're going to remove that animal. I'd rather them do it in a regulated way than an unethical and illegal way, uh, especially because those illegal ways, again, we're talking poison and other things that are not a good way, not only for a coyote to die, but of course maybe some non-targets that are exposed to it. So I'm kind of kind of wrap it up, um, but if you want more information, I'll keep this slide up here for a while, uh, but we do have sources of information. We actually, I'm going to say this, it's an oxymoron, but we do have a coyote management plan. Um, I say it's an oxymoron because again, it's hard to manage coyote numbers. You, you can't. Uh, but we were asked by the North Carolina General Assembly a few years ago to come up with a coyote management plan turned out to be a really positive thing because we could really flesh out what works, what doesn't work, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing for coyotes in North Carolina, and it provided a really good opportunity to educate uh, the decision makers that we have in this state. Basically, educate them why we shouldn't have bounties, educate them why we shouldn't have a year-round coyote trapping season, um, educate them on what things can be done if there is a true issue. Um, I'm part of a fur bear working group in the southeast and we also came up with a coyote synthesis document. I know some of you come like you know you retired from maybe the science field and so I thought I'd bring that up because this audience would appreciate it. We, in the southeast we're like man we were one of the last places for coyotes to establish themselves in the United States. And again, North Carolina was the last state for coyotes to establish themselves. There's still a relatively new predator on the landscape. We, we started to see more research being done and we were like, we really need to get that research together to give us a fuller picture of what coyote populations are doing in the Southeast. So in 2020, we produced a synthesis document. It basically summarizes all the research that's been done on